Would you all stand with me as we read the scripture for today? Today's scripture reading is Mark 6, 30 to 44. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that had been done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. The word of the Lord. Have you ever had one of those Sundays where you're just led before the Lord and everything so far has been on point? The growth group, our, when Michael and the Grace Tones brought us before in worship, you know, the 321 boxes of hope for, Chris, for children around the world. I don't really think we need any more time to worship. I mean, I mean I'm still going to preach. Oh, I was. I still will. But we don't need it. God has already done so much in the service, and it's already so many times that we have to pray but, and worship, and I'm thankful for that. What a wonderful service we've had. But we are at that point in the calendar. We need to talk about this and be honest with us, each other. There's people, there, there, we need to talk about the people who are going to be gathered who are hungry, who have waited way too long to eat, and who are anticipating a good meal. Am I talking about Thanksgiving or the feeding of the 5,000? It's a feeding of the 5,000, but it's not Thanksgiving. But that is on the agenda of us. But we can relate to the emotions that are surrounded in this story that Bria just read to us already, that are standing out from the life of Jesus and these people, where they had a long day, where they are tired, they're hungry, they're Desperate, they have worries that are overwhelming them. These are, have you experienced any of these emotions today? Just me? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> but these, while I'm not going to ignore the, what's ahead of us, the obvious here. Am I on the microphone, guys? Okay. Couldn't hear myself. Thank you. So, are, we're not ignoring Thanksgiving, but we can use that calendar day. That's, that, by the way, it's not just an average Thanksgiving. Did you know that it's the 400th? 400th Thanksgiving? Because the first one, if we recognize the pilgrims and the Native Americans, sat in 1621. How about that? The turkey probably has been cooking ever since then. Um, the, <laughs> sorry. Um, but this first meal, this first meal that, we are, that shows the day of celebration between these people showed that, just like this passage does today too, where the meets, physical meets are, needs are met, just like ours too. But our, this passage that Jesus shows us where he, he feeds these 5,000 people, they're not just physical needs that are met. There's emotional ones and spiritual ones as well. And that's what we're, when we look at Mark 6. We're going to take out these themes from it with the most important thing, the one thing that you have to come home with. 
and talk, think, be playing with in your mind over the single thought that I want to make sure you understand what we're going to talk a lot about today is God meets our every need. God meets our every need. And that's what I keep seeing every time I look through this passage. God meets our every need. It helps me understand who God is just a little bit more because he meets our physical needs. He meets our emotional needs and our spiritual needs, all of them. Jesus doesn't just care about our spiritual well-being and ignores the rest. God cares for our physical needs when we can see that for our, our every needs. And God, we can see that by looking at this passage. So I know we just had an eloquent reader read it once more, but we're going to do it again. Look at me in Mark chapter 6, which is in the Newer Testament, and starting in verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus, reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. So with the start of this feeding of the 5,000, we have this introduction. And my mind goes to the usual places when I hear about this passage. Feeding of the 5,000? All right. Big time miracle. Buku food. Excellence. And yeah, that is a lot of the, uh, a way of things, showing the authority of God. That is a theme. Yes. But there's more to it than just that. Because this passage helps us understand that's our first perspective from it. That Jesus cares for our well-being. Jesus cares for our well-being. And, it's, and we can see this with the time of gathering that Jesus, Jesus and the apostles had together, as we saw in verse 30. And this is the first time that these, the, the group has been together since Jesus sent the apostles out and doing ministry and commissioned them to go earlier in the chapter, in verses 7 through 13, as you can see in your, own, in your Bible. But when I look at this, there's one really big thought that, in my mind, this makes total lot of sense. They gather back they, after having been gone. He wants to hear about what they've been doing, the highs and the lows, the ministry. Kind of sounds like our business meeting that we just had. Or just me. Yeah, because you know we love those. But this is, you can see these. The apostles are gathering. They're sharing what their ministry has done in the last time. They talk to each other. They talk about the great things, the hard, the hard things, the difficult thing. Shay's in the background speeding up the clock, trying to keep things on task. That's just how I see this. But, and of course, they also had a nap time and a snack, too. Shay, snack next time? Just think about it. We'll work on it. Okay. But anyway, as of this time, in all reality, this was a time of solitude. A time of gathering together of non-ministry related time together. And it's something they needed. They could have gone like, all right, back in town. Yeah, the gang's back together. Let's go into town and do some more miracles. Yeah, they could have. But Jesus instead showed, showed them what rest is. And meet, to be refreshed by God. Even taking a little half day, a planned half day away from doing ministry. And yeah, that sounds weird to say, isn't it? Away from doing ministry. But it's something that we need to think about. God calls us to be restful, to have rest. We, God tells us to take Sabbath time together, our time with him and God, as well as time to meet our needs of our physical body, the rest that we all need, to know our weary hearts, to take a night off, to take a season off from doing a ministry, knowing that God will provide others to step up and do. It's weird to hear. It's weird to say. But I still think it's important because Jesus shows the importance of rest that we need to meet our well-being. But while this time of talk, this time of gathering, this time of sharing didn't go as planned. Jesus had, you know, because I'm sure the plan of Jesus meeting up with these people, these men that he cares for so much, they're talking about what they had done, about the things that they are planning to do. Perhaps they shared some fried chicken together. I don't know. That's the Baptist in me trying to say that, but... Either way, they all share their adventures together, but plans change. And you know what? We may not like it, but plans do change. We need to just go with it. Because that's what we see here in verse 33 through 34. And, but many who, saw them having, having, um, many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot. 
from the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. While the plans did change for Jesus and his disciples, the plan to time together to rest, to rejoice, to share of what God has done through them, the greater need was coming before them. And that's what we need to understand, that the, this remote, these people came to Jesus to this remote place. Can you just imagine that? They're in an isolated place to have a time alone, a time of by themselveness. These townies recognize Jesus. Somebody recognized Jesus or one of the apostles. And then they followed him around this body of water to meet him there, hoofing it just on the rumor that Jesus was there, that they, somebody had saw Jesus. The excitement of seeing the master caused these people to hightail it around to this isolated place. And to me, this would be like what G if Jesus were on vacation, taking time away, he, it would be like getting on vacation and walking off the plane and seeing your church family, your boss, your kids, your neighbor, and be like, oh, hi, just saw you. And, you know, he, time, he, Jesus could have said, y'all, you're crowding me. Leave me alone. I need some time. And nobody would have, like, bat an eye, like, oh, yeah, we all need some time. Yeah, that makes sense. But no, he could have. He didn't. Instead, he had compassion on them by meeting the needs of these people. Jesus had a compassion, a deep pity for these people because he was moved to the core, because they were sheep without a shepherd. And that's a term I think we can all understand, especially in our world and society today, the sheep without a shepherd. There are, there are still plenty of people who need, who are eager to listen, who want to be shepherded by the great shepherd, by Jesus himself. And we need to be, make sure we have compassion for these people too, even at the expense of our own time away, of our own tasks that need to be done every, every day and every week. Because after all, their lives were changed because Jesus decided to forego his plans and share this miracle with them. Be willing to share, to meet, to have compassion on people. To help them, point them towards a Savior. Because Jesus surround, was surrounded by these people who had no spiritual leadership, who needed help. We can be thankful that there are people in our lives, in our church, who are great at doing this. At great at telling people and sharing the gospel with us. We need to do the same. In our own community, in our own sphere of influence. Jesus did because he had plans changed. And let's be honest, when plans go sideways, when things unexpected popped up, how are you responding to them? When somebody unexpected drops in, how are you responding? Is it of frustration and anger and quiet grumblings in your, in your mind and head? Or is it filled with a response of compassion, of kindness, love? That's what God, I think it should be the second, not the first. But I get it. There are some days where you just want to put your feet up, grab a cup of coffee, and shut your phone off and run from the world. We all have those days. Mine are called Mondays. But we have in those moments and out of those moments, we have to not do those. We always have to be willing to be an example of God. Always be prepared to give a defense, to share other people with God even at the expense of our own personal time, to have compassion on these people it's for their well-beings, for their well-being. And that's what Jesus was doing because I think it's time for a miracle. While the feeding of the 5,000 is an, one of my favorite miracles, it's an unbelievable ex story ex from history, this multiplication of snacks. We're being taught in a very, a very important message from God that he meets our every need. And we've already seen Jesus meeting the needs of our, the well-being of the people around us by seeing their emotional and compassion, having compassion on them. For us, it could be 
doing ministry, taking time off, spending time in meditation with God in prayer. It could be changing plans. We need to be willing to help Jesus meet the well, our well-being. And also, for our second principle, we need to help Jesus will develop our faith. Jesus will develop our faith. So like I said, the original plan went sideways on this discreet boat trip. And it has been, all the people came to see Jesus, to hear him. And Jesus had compassion and started doing ministry with them, started teaching them. And verse 35 and 36 tells us this time of teaching, this Sunday morning service, turned into a long day. Now that's not going to happen here. I'm not going to be, it's not going to be dark and we're still going to be sitting here listening to me talk. That's not going to happen. But just let it, but in this situation, it did. The day was about over. And I don't know about yourself, but when the day is over, there's two things I really want. A nap, dinner. Two things the people couldn't do while they're in the countryside in an isolated place. After all, friends, there's no 7-Elevens where they can just run over and get a Slurpee and a wizard finger. There's no Motel 6 with the, keeping the light on waiting for them to have a room. These people are in the middle of the countryside. And their physical needs are real for this. Jesus still met their needs. Because in verse 37, Jesus surprisingly told them, you give them something to eat. And then they said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wage. We're, are we going to spend that much on bread and give it to them? Oh, Whew. that's an interesting talk, conversation between the apostles and Jesus. You give them something to eat. Huh. Okay. Jesus put the task of feeding these thousands on the shoulders of his disciples, of his followers. This back-breaking, bank account draining task of feeding a feast of people is a difficult one. After all, if we think about it from last week, how much pizza could you really eat? Now, times that times 5,000. How much could you eat at a church potluck? I've seen the Lesline boys tear down their own share of pizza. So I know, just multiply that times 5,000. But at this, this, this conversation, response but from Jesus of you feed them, is the first reaction we get is, it would take more than a half a year's wage. Their first reaction goes, well, you know how much that'll cost? <laughs> Jesus knew exactly how much that would cost. This ta and this mini freak out session got to them. Because these guys go to extreme, go to 11, about how they can feed these 5,000 people. Plus, there are still the women and children who we assume were there too. This 5,000 is just the men. Who knows how much it would. It would take six to eight months of wages. And have you ever thought like where they would get that much food too? Yeah, Jesus, if, even if there was, if they had the money, where would they go buy it? Where would, there's no Walmart in this kind of time of period. There's no P, Pete's Fresh markets or, you know, Whole Foods around. They're going to just clear off the stock of everyone and go w walk over and cook themselves a meal. Kathy Waters pops up and starts cooking. That's not what's happening here. But should they have had this mini meltdown, this freakout session is the question. Should the apostles have uh, free, had this uh, crisis of faith? After all, they have seen Jesus do an awful lot, showing his authority as God. And, he, and the, of all the miracles that we've seen in these first few chapters, has the, the theme has been, Jesus is God, have faith. Great things will happen. They're missing on one of these right now. Disciples should have had great faith. God was not expecting Peter to pull a feast out of his backpack and be like, sure, here's my wallet. How much do you need today? There's nothing in here. I just wanted to bring it out. There's, there's, there's no money in there. But instead, after none, these guys, instead of having great faith in God, their little faith was easily overwhelmed by fear by worry, 
disappointment. Is that how you would respond to it? Is that, your, is that your natural reaction when things go bad? But that's not what we need to do. Because God, we're seeing here the theme that God can provide for each and every one of us to meet all our needs. All we need to have is faith. Because God will provide, or take our little faith and move it to great things. But somehow, the Apostle Andrew, somehow of his, does a survey of the crowd and sees there's one little boy who susses out that he has five loaves, two fishes. So let's talk bread and fish just for like a quick minute because I love talking bread. I tried making bread. Andrea has eaten a lot of terrible bread. But when you think of bread, where does your mind go? When you think of bread from this story, where does your mind go? Is it like most of Western American Westerners thinking like a French bread? Wonder bread? Giant life sloses of white bread? Or you think more creative mindset. Are you thinking pita? Sourdough? Bread rolls? Are you hungry now? Are you thinking of catfish? Of whitefish, salmon, tuna? What's your mind thinking of when you think of bread and fish? Well, these are all types of bread and fish. And when you, talk, when you can say that you would be correct, that these were our types of bread and fish, but they're not factual types that would be there today. In fact, the, lo the loaves of bread were probably just round, flat loaves. Most of one would be good for a single person. The fish. Ugh, the fish. This is not anything you would see at Red Lobster. In fact, they say it was most likely two small dried preserved fish. Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. I thought it should be goldfish. Personally, everyone's favorite snack. Because, you know, it's a snack that smiles back. Here goes, Leslie. But these people have, some have speculated that these five croutons and two sushis are food that someone had for their family, that they were bringing home for their family to eat. But they gave to the master by faith instead. That's a very great thought. No way to prove if it's correct. I just like that thought. There's no way to prove that, but I like it. But these five loaves of Pita, let's just call them what they are. These five pieces of bread and two preserved fish. What a feast that would have provided, huh? What a feast. The first five, six people probably ate really well in that feast. The other 4,900, eh, you can watch. You can watch. But how does these five rolls and two sardines show us how God meets our needs? How does it show us that we need to have mature colossal size faith in God. Well, these five crackers and two Swedish fish show us that we need to be thankful for what we have, knowing that God will take our meager, our little, our tiny bit of faith and can use it in great ways. That goes for this child's lunch to us ourselves. Looking back later, I'm sure the apostles, when they reflected on this day, probably pre felt pretty silly. Realizing that Jesus was just not, he wasn't asking them to go buy, cook, pay for these food. Instead, he really wanted them to have faith and believe in that God can do greatness through them. To have faith in the Messiah. That's what he really wanted. He does the same for each of us too, providing us what we need, when we need, in the meeting our needs, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, each and every time, at the perfect time. The Son of God has authority over all things, friends. He takes our meager offerings, like these five breadsticks and two popcorn shrimp, and that could feed just a few people, and instead uses them to feed everyone. That's what a little faith in God can do. That's what he can do. He can do. By, Jesus took a, can meet a lot of needs by developing their faith. And that brings us to our third perspective in that. Jesus deserves 
our thanks. Jesus deserves our thanks. And like I said, this moment in time where Jesus takes these seven items and brings them before and creates a buffet of food. I cannot ignore the most important part in verse 40 and 41. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, so he divided the two fish among them also. So when I say, give thanks to your mind, Michael's already talked a little bit about it too, with our beautiful song that he's led us in. What does your mind go to though? When you think of this type of type of prayer that Jesus had, is it well, mine went to, when I read this, was like, oh yeah, we do this right before we eat dinner. We sit on the couch. I mean, we eat at the table. And we thank God for the food that he gave us, right? That's what we do. When you say thank God, we say the little tiny prayer. We say before while our food's still hot, right? Is that it? Is that what Jesus is saying? <laughs> Not really. It, that's a limited understanding of what being thankful to God is. The word here in the, is... Hugaleo, meaning, as Michael showed us already, to praise, to bless. While that can, the range of it can be used to bless or to praise, it can also be used to say something commendatory, to speak well of, to praise. It's more than just a, a little tiny recite, re rehearsed prayer that we do before, while, before we eat. That is just a limited understanding of what it means to thank God. We need to be more in our understanding in our, of what thankfulness is. But here's the stumper. Is Jesus being nice? Is Jesus speaking well? Or is he thankful for the bread and the fish? Or the one who provided it? What is the thankfulness that Jesus in this prayer? Where is it being applied to, is what I'm asking. That's the same question that we can say too when we meet, gather around Thursday's dinner. Are we thankful for the turkey, the fish, whatever you guys eat? Are we thankful for the people that cooked it, that physically did all the work? Are we thankful for God who provided it? That is the question that, we need, that is needing to be answered. And the thing is, while we need to be thankful for what's in front of us, for the people who provided what's in front of us, that's not it. Those are, should both be secondary reasons to be thankful. While our primary reason to Galeo, to bless God, will be God, for, God, first and foremost, deserves our thanks for this meal. For, I think there's other 9,999 other ones. If I, if I got the math right for 10,000 reasons. Yeah, in this, this situation too, Kind of reminds me of Passover too, if we think about it, the breaking of the breaking of bread, the prayer, the giving giving grace to God. Something to think about as we talk about finish our time together. But th th we need to be thankful to God in each situation, even when it looks like everyone is going to go hungry. So even when there is bountifulness, no matter if there's good or bad, we still are called to give thanks to God in every situation, because God is the one who provided for us, no matter if it's good or bad, no matter if we're gathered around a family of 50 on Thursday, no matter if we're sitting in front of a computer screen staring at Zoom while eating leftovers. Possibility for some of us. We need to be thankful because we have a good, good Father who provides for us. But somehow, in this prayer, God takes these five pieces of bread, two fish, and provides an endless amount of food to anyone, and a, a, so, a supply so great that no one can, I can't even imagine how much food he made for these people. Because in verse 42, it says, they all ate and were satisfied. Were satisfied. Each counted male here was 5,000, as we said. Were satisfied by God through this miracle of provision. And when I say satisfied here, this is it really understand the implications are. It's not just 5,000 people were fed. Here's your slice of fish. Here's your piece of bread. Get to the back of the line. Lunch lady style. No. 
That's not what it is. This is the type of thing of understanding in the Greek. It's understanding that it's a concept used before fattening animals. <laughs> Think about that for a second. They were satisfied like a pig who cannot stop eating. Or like when you leave your dog food bag out and your dog just keeps eating until it, it, not knowing when to stop and until there's nothing left in the bag. Satisfied. That is what Jesus did after giving thanks to God who provided it. Each had their a little bit and were satisfied with as much, eating as much as they could. Can you imagine how much bread and fish that would take in all reality to feed this many people, to fatten up this many humans, to stuff them so much where they cannot move? Again, another great example of satis being satisfied. That is what Jesus did through God. Have you, ever done, have you ever been that type of fat and happy after a meal? You, oh, you don't have to answer, right? Because I know some of you have. I'll be honest. The last time I did was when you guys hired me. Andrew and I made reservations to a Brazilian steakhouse where it's all the meat you can eat. And we were celebrating for obvious reasons. My sensible wife stopped eating halfway through because she was filled. She was satisfied. <laughs> she said, are you done? No. Come here. And then like 10 more gouchers came out and sliced me more meat. And I just ate until I um, did the unbuckle thing. You know, you had to loosen the top button of your pants. And then you just sit. Then they said, you want some more? I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I got room now. Pants are, pants are loose. And then I ate more and more. That I was, until I was satisfied. That's what Jesus did for these people. They ate and until they were satisfied. But the idea of being satisfied, being thankful for what we have is key here. Because as believers in God, we need not to just be thankful, but to be satisfied with God, to be overflowing with thanks to our God for what he has provided for us in all aspects of life, not just a good portion, in all aspects of God. So what do we do now? How do we take what we've learned from this story of the feeding of the 5,000 so after seeing that God can meet all of our needs? We can start by practicing these principles in our life this week. Heck, we can start today. The day's not over yet. We can, by living out each day, knowing that Jesus cares for our well-being. Jesus develops our little faith into a Great faith. Jesus deserves our thanks. And yes, I understand Thursday is the national day of being thankful. I'm grateful for Thursday. It's, it's a day we should, we take our little thanks for the meal, for the circumstances, for the family, for the November 25th, and we praise God for it. Yes, that is what Thanksgiving is about. While, yes, I will be thanking God for the sweet potato pie and the moist turkey this year. But that's not all. That's just a start. We need to be thankful to God as the one who, for being in charge of all the circumstances of our life. For the four-star meal that we will eat. For the people who provided it. As well as the family, the friends, the, people, the jobs, the everything in our, every part of our life. But we should also be thankful for the one-star frozen dinner that we might have to be eating. For the friends and family who can't come and meet with us to be in person. God provided both. We need to be thankful. And our thanks should not be conditional either. Truly overflowing of thanks and satisfaction. God met every one of our needs this year. And continue will do so. Just have, All we need to do is have faith in the provider. In his perfect timing in his perfect way. And I can I'm not I'm done hiding my gratitude for God meeting all of our physical, our emotional, most importantly, my spiritual needs. Let, let me pray. Father, Father God in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we can be here today to be worshiping you. To thank you for everything that you've done through our church, through our lives, individual for Illinois and worldwide. We are thankful and grateful to you as the one who provided all. Father, teach us to continue to be examples of you and how we 
live our lives of people who are gratitude for knowing that you can and will meet all of our needs. In your name we pray.